when you give this talk next time, and the title is What Has Changed Since the End of the Mighty Study, you can finish in two seconds everything. So, uh, which one? No need. PC, I'm trying. Doesn't do anything. In my hand. Okay. Could you stay here for <laughs> Thank you. So, can you restart the clock? Okay. So, here is my question. You have a dog in your car and it throws up. Okay, can you come back because I'm pressing the damn thing. Sorry. <sighs> I'm a surgeon, by the way. have to go back to the dog. So what happens? Throw the toy. Ah! You have two options. You can put <coughs> the one on the left, refreshener, or you can remove it. So I don't want to go into this anymore. I want to go uh, talk a little bit about surgical technique because this is really crucial. You have to go step by step. Number one, you have to scrape the epithelium. We hate to scrape it in general with good reason, but in this case, if you don't, your visibility is going to be extremely poor. So start with the surface of the corneal. Instantly, you will have a much better view of the posterior segment than you otherwise would. You can see the difference immediately. Anterior chamber, there are a couple of things in the anterior chamber. You have fibrin and you have circulating elements. You have to irrigate and then you have to go in with a forceps, with aspiration and get the fibrin off. Sometimes you have to do it repeatedly, especially in children, because it can reaccumulate. The, the good thing about this fibrin is if you have a forceps and you grab it, and you're slow, you can remove it not only from the pupillary area, but also from the angle. So be patient and it will come out. Then you have to look at the pupil. You need a wide pupil. So you can use visco, you can use uh, medications, uh, adrenaline, and if that's not enough, then you have to put uh, iris retractors. A small pupil will do for most of our surgeries. It will not do in a endophthalmitis case. Then you have to make a large opening in the posterior capsule. So you irrigate uh, the capsular bag as well. That's not the stage where you want to operate. This is a very difficult case because what is behind it? So that's one of the, of the reasons why early surgery is recommended. This is difficult, this, is, this increases the risk of retinal damage during surgery. So you try to do the surgery before uh, the pus in the vitreous uh, reaches this stage. Now, I think it's in crucial to go and do a very thorough posterior vitrectomy, but you have to be more careful in the anterior part of the, the vitreous cavity. So how much you remove of this purulent vitreous in the periphery uh, is a judgment call. I think it is crucial uh, to detach the posterior hyaloid. As I said earlier, it is not detached. And this endophthalmitis has already had surgery, vitrectomy, before by another surgeon. This is what was left behind. And those white dots that you see 
are colonies of bacteria which are still there. If you don't detach this, then you leave pus behind. Now we come to the macula. This is what the EVS did not recommend to do. There is an easy case like this one, and then you have a more difficult case. But if you don't do uh, a posterior, true posterior vitrectomy, this is what you leave on the macula. A hypopion pus sitting on the surface. Why? Because the patient is in bed, and this is heavy stuff, it is going to sit on the macula. So make sure that you do not leave this behind. Sorry. Uh, and as I, I, you heard already before, the EVS did not do a complete vetrectomy because it was afraid of creating a retinal break. We do not want to create a retinal break, but our primary enemy is not the retinal detachment because we can fix that. Our primary goal is to fight the infection. So if you have a doubt, I don't routinely use silicone oil, uh, but if you have a doubt whether you created a retinal break or not, uh, then silicone oil remains an option and we can discuss it uh, if we have time. But the main thing is you want to save the eye, you want to save vision. One brief question, because you're on surgical parts. I found out that uh, having two phagic eyes is not uh, that difficult, but compared to phagic eyes, vitrectomy really is a challenge because uh, all the infiltrates, the glue at the back of the lens, and that makes visualization of the posterior segment much more difficult. It's absolutely true, and that's why I said that in this case, you have to have a very meticulous uh, careful, so, slow, anterior, posterior approach. So you go layer by layer. If that's the case, then the first thing once you are inside the vitreous cavity in a phacic eye is to detach the anterior hyaloid from the lens. I have a question. I have a question. Uh, thanks. Uh, a question. How do you manage the IOL and the capsule bag if you are treating in uh, postoperative and ophthalmitis after cataract surgery, you remove routinely the lens and the bag? No. Uh, I used to do that in, in the very early uh, years, uh, but nowadays it's extremely rare that I would remove the lens. On the other hand, uh, if I make a judgment call during surgery that I cannot do a complete job without removing the lens, I will remove the lens and the whole capsule. Because as we all know, we, not some other surgeons, uh, we know that what determines the outcome is the retina and the cerebral body, not whether there is a posterior capsule and the lens. I just want to make a comment on this because there are so many variables on what each surgeon does that this is what I, I agree with uh, uh, Murat, uh, uh, that the fact of having specific experience with this is so important. Uh, so one, um, one thing to look at, talking about this, which you did not mention, is that the reason why we do a posterior capsulotomy or capsulectomy is that essentially, mm, I think you, you as well use antibiotics in your infusion. Yes. So it makes a big difference. Yes. If you're using antibiotics in the infusion as you go along, or if you're using them at the end of the surgery. Because we generally mm, remove enough vitreous to have a sample to send to the lab, but then we put antibiotics in the, in the bottle, and at that point you get a continuous flow of antibiotics in the anterior chamber, through the uh, uh, bag, through the capsulotomy, into the posterior chamber, 
uh, uh, vitreous cavity and vice versa. So it's a continuous flow. You're just not adding antibiotics in the end, which, which do not go anteriorly because you have aqueous forming anteriorly and therefore the antibiotics which you put in the vitreous cavity will probably stay in the vitreous cavity. So it's a, or at least they go anteriorly in a different concentration. So that is why you can actually leave the IOL and the bag uh, in place. That's one point. Second point which I want to make is that when you are, you have to detach the posterior hyaloid, but it is so dangerous to have a complete detachment of the posterior hyaloid because uh, the retinal breaks on a very fragile retina. So generally what I do is something I call macular fenestration, which essentially means I open up the posterior hyaloid just up to the arcades so that I'm getting the antibiotics where I want them, which is on the macula, and I'm not pulling on the hyaloid peripherally where I will get the more uh, adherent uh, uh, tractions on the vessels and I can actually determine uh, uh, retinal breaks. So these are two points, again, which are come down to uh, personal experience. Mm -hmm. well, can we take some more questions? One, one, possibly. One, possibly. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, is the mic on? Please look. I was talking about the ultrasonography before yeah, performing the vitrectomy. Do you usually aspirate? I'm sorry. In order to know if there's a retinal detachment, uh, it's, it's hard to know because when the vitreous is so dense, uh, the ultrasonography yes. many times doesn't clear almost. Correct. But do, do you ask for it before doing it? No. Or you try to do it? No. 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 Never? Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> just between the two of us, never. But what I will tell you what I do. I assume there is a retinal detachment, so I go for the worst case scenario. And in those cases, what I do is I do a tunnel. So, in other words, not horizontally shaving the vitreous, but doing a a vertical tunnel on the nasal side. And once you are, unfortunately, behind the retina, it rarely happens, but it can happen, immediately you know where you are, and then you will spare the more important part of the retina. What I don't want, again, is to leave pus behind. Mm -hmm.